I'm excited. We're starting a new series, Hot Topics. Hot Topics. You've heard it said. You've heard it said. Because there's a lot of things that we've heard it said, and you know what? It may not, it may sound good. It may even make sense, but it's not biblical. It may sound logical. It may, you may even like it, but it's not biblical. Jesus was addressing these things. We just came out of a series um, that uh, to be or not to be, and Jesus has taken his disciples up on the mountain. He has given this sermon, what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talked to them about the Beatitudes, the blessings, what it is to be blessed, that no matter what you go through, no matter what you experience, you're blessed. And it's not because you just say you're blessed or you just think you're blessed, it's because of Jesus. And he tells his disciples this, and then in this same Sermon on the Mount, this is a, just a continuation of that, Pastor David presented last week of being salt and light to the world. He says, Jesus is saying, hey, you're blessed. If this happens, this happens, it doesn't matter. You're blessed because of me. Therefore, you can be salt and light to this world that needs to see, that needs to taste and see what God is, who God is, and what he has done for them. And then he continues in this sermon, and he begins to clarify his purpose who he is among the people, and that what his mission is. And so many times people think Jesus, he came to change everything. He came to, you know, this was the law, and now now there's grace, and and, and and it canceled out the law, and it changed what God had said, and now Jesus has come on the scene, and in some elements people go, yeah, I don't like the law, I like Jesus. And believe me, people still do that. So Hot Topics, we're, we're starting that this week. You can go to your smartphone. You can see on the Bible app on Uversion Live. Uh, on, you can go to events, and it's a live stream. All the notes are there. You can do that on the back of the bulletin. I encourage you to lean in. So here's where we start, Matthew five seventeen. Again, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. He's, he's preached about blessing the Beatitudes. He's preached about salt and light. But then he brings something to clarify, to make sure they understand that's applicable to us today. Matthew 5, 17, do not think, he says, that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Knowing the law and the prophets was critical, was a critical point of Jesus' message. He didn't say, hey, you know, all this other stuff, everything you've always known, yeah, forget that. What I'm telling you is, uh uh-uh. But sometimes people approach the message of Christ, the gospel, that way. Oh, yeah, I don't know about all that other stuff, but I just like what Jesus has to offer. Jesus is clarifying to his closest disciples, hey, listen, here's the deal. The law and the prophets, yeah, I didn't come to change that. I I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Knowing creates an obligation to obey. Knowing creates an obligation to obey. So what God tells us, we're responsible for, amen? I mean, if God thinks it's important enough that we should know it, we should probably lean into it, but knowing that creates an obligation to obey what God says, amen? Rules and regulations, we all love those, right? (laughs) Rules and regulations, you know, we like the rules and regulations when they benefit us. We like the rules and regulations when it's easy. Can I tell you, Jesus didn't come to throw out rules and regulations. Oh, we live by grace. I love grace because there's no rules or regulations to grace. That's not grace, church. But that's how the modern church oftentimes presents the message of Christ. Oh, because of Christ, now we can do whatever we want to do. Jesus knew this would happen. That's why he is making this very important in the middle of his very first sermon to his closest followers. Rules and regulations. He's not saying, hey, I've come to abolish those. There's no more rules and regulations. There's no more. No, he, did, he, he made sure they understood, I have not come to do that. I've come to fulfill those, to honor those Know this, ignorance is no excuse. We've heard that. Ignorance is no excuse when it comes to the things of God. Sometimes people say, well, I just don't know 
if I knew more about the Bible, I'd probably appreciate it more. I'd probably follow it, but I just don't know. So I, listen, ignorance is no excuse. The Apostle Paul, he wrote the book of Romans in the Bible. He says, Romans 1, 18 through 20, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So when we are unrighteous, we suppress the truth. We suppress the known things of God. Well, what are those things? Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them. He says, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. When we are unrighteous, when we live contrary to what the Bible says, Paul says it here, we're without excuse. God is evident in his creation. I look out at the sunrise, I look out at the sunset, I look at the mountains, I look at space. Uh, a couple nights ago, the stars were just gorgeous. So you look at all these individual stars and the constellations, and I go, yeah, there's something bigger going on here. Or do I go, wow, chance is such an incredible thing. <laughs> the Bible says God is evident in his creation to the point. Yeah, but I just don't know. No. He's evident in his creation to the point we're without excuse. We're without excuse to follow him, to lean into him, to grow in our knowledge of him. Just because someone says they do not believe in God because they do not understand, listen, church, is no excuse. I realize I'm probably preaching to the crowd or to the, to the uh, choir. I realize that probably most of you in in closer form, we agree more than we disagree on some of this. But you bring the staunch atheist in here. You bring a staunch atheist, a person who does not believe in, in a God or an intelligent design or doesn't believe in any of that. Bible says they're without excuse. They're without excuse. Now, most of us would go, amen, amen, you know. The truth is, we're all without excuse. We can't go, well, I just, you know, I know the Bible says, but I just really, I, I feel, I, yeah, we're without excuse. Agreeance does not equal assurance of truth. Write that down. Agreeance does not equal assurance of truth. Just because we agree upon something doesn't mean it's truth. Well, you know, we've all really, we look at it and we just really feel, and so we all kind of agree on this, that, that that's okay, or that we can push that to the side. We realize that, you know, you know, others kind of think this, but we agree upon this. That doesn't make it truth, church. The Bible is a foundation for our living. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through him. That's it. That's what the Bible says. Okay, so just because we may agree that, well, maybe there's another way. Maybe, maybe you know, we, we kind of agree that maybe Jesus is the best way, but there's other ways. That doesn't make that truth. See, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. No one, there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved but that of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says, amen? Jesus clarified, and speaking of the, of the complexities of the community, you know, we got a community, we have a culture, we have a society that's not necessarily in agreement with what the Bible says, and just because it's in agreement in another arena doesn't mean that is truth. Jesus clarifies, he says, Matthew 5, 18, he says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. <laughs> he, says, he says, listen, I haven't come to abolish it. I've come to fulfill it, and not one little tiny thing is gonna change. They understood him saying, when he said iota and dot, in the Hebrew language, if you, if you, if you, you could change the entire meaning of a word with, 
with an iota. You could put this little hash mark. We would maybe understand it like an apostrophe or a comma, and it would change the meaning of the word. Jesus is saying, just, just a little mark, just a little dot. I mean, we understand it in our language. You can, you can change the whole meaning of, of something with a comma. For instance, if I said, hey, uh, you know, let's eat, comma, grandpa. <laughs> let's eat, grandpa, comma. But let's take the comma away. Let's eat, grandpa. <laughs> Change the meaning a little bit, right? Jesus is saying, hey, one iota, one dot, until heaven and earth pass away. Well, guess what? You're here today, so evidently something's going on. Jesus said, it's not going to pass away until it's all accomplished. I've come to fulfill it. There's something to be accomplished. It's through him. He's telling his disciples this on the side of the mountain. He thought this was important. Hey, listen, don't change any of this. Don't think I've come to water anything down. Don't think I've come to, to push it to the side and say, oh, I, I get it, that was the old way, but now the new way. No, 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 no. Not one iota, not one dot will change. We say this, we say we cross our T's and dot our I's. We, we talk of that regarding specifics in life. Nothing's dynamic until it's specific. Jesus is saying, hey, I am the specific. I am the one. I'm the fulfillment. Nothing changes. I've come on the scene. Oh, yeah, all, this other, all these things you've heard, all this stuff. Yeah, no, listen, I'm here. I'm on the scene, and there's a fulfillment that's got to happen. So what, what was the law in the understanding of Jesus' hearers of the day? Well, According to a commentary, Barclay in 2001 uh, wrote, uh, wrote a commentary the Jews used to use the expression the law in four different ways. Number one, they used it to mean the Ten Commandments. So we understand the Ten Commandments. They, they understood law as, as residing in that concept. They understood, uh, number two, they used it to mean the first five books of the Bible, which was called the Pentateuch. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And thirdly, they understood the law they used the phrase the law and the prophets to mean the whole scripture, and in their understanding was that of the Old Testament. And fourthly, they used it to mean the oral or the scribal law, the oral or the scribal law, the, 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 the said or the written word. And in the time Jesus was presenting the Sermon on the Mount, they were probably understanding more a concept of the oral and the scribal law Write this down, regard and respect, regard and, re, and respect. We understand rules and regulations, but the aspect of regard and respect, Jesus addresses, Matthew 5, 19, therefore whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So you can't relax it. He didn't come. Jesus didn't come. And I realize this steps on modern church gospel where people have used grace as an excuse for their behavior. Jesus said, hey, listen, he's telling his first disciples, the ones that many of them on the side of that mountain gave their life for the gospel. That same truth as it was presented on the mountain is still truth today, church, not popular. We call it a hot topic. Jesus said, you can't relax any one of these, not even the least commandment. Here's the thing, church, I'll be honest, that's convicting. That's convicting. And it should be. Because I think there's some things that we've allowed to just be pushed to the side. God understands. People understand times change. We got to be careful, church. We got to be careful. Regard and respect. It's one thing to say, I, well, I regard the Bible as something that speaks the truth, but it's another thing to take it further enough to respect it, to live it, to respect it, to apply it. 
consensus does not change truth. Very similar to agreeance does not equal assurance of truth, consensus does not change truth. Consensus does not change truth. Just because we all come together and we talk about it and, and there's a consensus of opinion doesn't mean we have now established truth. That's what the Word of God's for. That's Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's saying, hey, listen, you're going you're gonna to encounter some difficult times. That's what he talked about. But you're blessed. Hey, you got to go be salt and light to the world. But know this. There's a lot of rules and regulations, but you've got to have a regard for respect. And, and, and everybody's going to try to get on the same page. Listen, there's no other page to get on but my page. <laughs> Matthew 5, 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's intense. My righteousness the scribes and the Pharisees, man, that was some intense stuff. That was, but Lord, I mean, I thought grace made it easier. In some respects, it's not that it makes it easier. You now just don't owe a payment that you owed. He canceled your debt. We understand what a pardon is. I, I started thinking about this, to trying to explain this a little clearer. We understand what a pardon is. Let's say you committed a heinous crime. You committed something, it was horrible. It was bad. But through a series of circumstances, through legislation, through, through whatever, through favor, you were given a pardon. That'd be awesome, right? Oh, I've got a second chance. I, could, I, can, I, can, I don't have to live under that penalty. We understand pardon. And at no time would a pardon ever go, oh, I got a pardon, so now I can keep doing that. For some of you, that's going to be an epiphany. Well, I thought grace was a pardon. Okay, if grace is a pardon, it was never a license to continue doing what you've done. Hot topic. Woo! <laughs> it's an aspect, thirdly, of reverence. And righteousness. Reverence and righteousness. Reverence and righteousness, it's interesting, has a, has a lot to do with timing. We don't think of it that way, but it does. Uh, the time to have reverence and righteousness in our lives is now. You know, a lot of times people will play in their minds, well, you know, one day, you know, right now I'm just, the season I'm in, the, the, the stuff that I got going on, and one day I'll, I'll be able to really be more faithful with what God's given me. I'll be able to obey the word. I'll, I'll get into the word. I want one day I'll start really understanding. I'll get into a, a time where I can really study. But right now, I just, now listen, reverence and righteousness is for right now, today. Yeah, I'm just, you don't understand my life. No, you don't understand what God offers to those who follow him. Jesus is telling his disciples on the side of that mountain, listen, there, there is all these rules of regulation. There's this, this aspect of, uh, of, I realize, complication, but there's a, there's a need for reverence and righteousness, and it starts right now. It's not like Jesus presented in his message to them, hey, and when you get off the mountain, you know, consider some of the things I've said, and, you know, and over time, you know, apply those truths. That wasn't Jesus' intent. That wasn't his intent for his disciples. It was right now. Right now, this starts. Right now, this journey begins. Right now, reverence and righteousness. Because there's going to be a crowd that gathers. There's going to be a crowd that, that comes around. Let's call it culture. Let's call it the world. Let's call it whatever. But they're going to be a crowd that's going to be anti-God because they are pro-self. It's all about me. It's all about what I can do it's all about what happens to me. It's all about what makes me happy. And they're going to try to develop this consensus, and it has nothing to do with reverence and righteousness unto God. Paul talks about that, 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 5. He says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, he tells Timothy. Endure suffering. 
do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Jesus, in essence, is telling his disciples, hey, listen, there's going to be a lot of people coming around. There's going to be a lot of, just know this. I haven't come to replace any of this. They're going to want to cancel out all this, and they're going to even want to take my message and try to water it down and make grace something that gives a license for something, and, and that's not it. Listen, hold strong. I'm the fulfillment. I've come to accomplish what my Father has sent me. Jesus wanted his hearers to understand that his truth aligned with the laws of God and that they must walk intently and blamelessly in his truth. Psalms 15, 1 and 2 says, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. So was there a freedom in following Jesus, or was it just about rules of regular? Of course there was a freedom. I don't have to live like the world. I have freedom to live for the cause and the purpose of Christ. I don't have to find my identity in what I do or what somebody says I am because of things I've done in the past. I now have freedom to go forward in a new identity in Christ. That's powerful, church. Because if you're like me, you've done some things in the past that you really don't want to be defined by. There's some things that if that was your definition, then that would change any ability to be an influence, any ability to be a leader. But Jesus, he comes in the middle of it, and he grants us grace. And it's for now. And it's so that I can go forward in victory so I could go forward in the plan that he has for my life. So here's the thing. Permissible does not equate beneficial. Permissible does not equate beneficial. Let me explain something to you. Okay, so we were coming back we were coming back home from seeing our kids last week and we're traveling at night. We'd push the time, push the time, push the time. We're like, I, we don't like traveling at night that distance, but wanted to be with kids. And uh, this is as long as we could be. And uh, how many like 80 mile per hour on the interstate in South Dakota? <laughs> that's just, uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> and uh, when, you're, when you're leaving South Dakota, it's like, wah, wah. <laughs> you know, you, you come into Iowa, and you're like, I hate Iowa. Anyway, and so... <laughs> I'm kidding, not really. Anyway, so, uh, but when you're coming back home, whoo, baby, there's the line, there's the sign, 80 miles an hour, it's awesome. It's like you hear, oh, you know, it's like, we were having 60 mile per hour wind gusts from the west. The truck was doing this, 80 miles per hour is permissible, not beneficial. (laughs) So we get this concept. Well, I could do this. See, I have freedom in Christ, and I don't care what you think. I have that freedom, and, and Christ has given me that freedom. Okay, let's play that. But it may not be beneficial. Maybe that person's going, I just, man, I really struggle with that, and I, man, I don't understand. I I don't have that kind of freedom, and I just, we got to be careful. We got to be careful. Paul says it, 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 24, like the New International Version, how he puts it. He says, I have the right to do anything. He says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Oh yeah, Jesus brings a freedom. He brings it. He brings a freedom to our life. But it's not just for us. Remember, he talked about what it is to be blessed, because if you don't know what it is to be blessed, in the sermon, he, he starts out in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, if you don't know what it is to be blessed, you may be living a blessed life and don't even know it. You actually are going to God going, God, I just, I don't know why your blessings elude me when in reality you really are blessed. You're just not leaning in 
to the one who brings the blessing regardless of your circumstance, situation, feeling, or complexity. Jesus knew there would be hot topics. He knew there would be struggles. He knew, and he wasn't saying, hey, listen, time out. All this stuff you've heard, all these things, I realize it's difficult, it's complex, but just lean into me. Throw out all that and just lean into my grace and live your life however you want. Nowhere in Scripture are you going to find that. But you will in culture. You will in society. His disciples would encounter, and he knew they would encounter difficulty in determining truth. That's why he says, you, you got to come, you got to bring it all back to me. You got you to do it all through me. It's unto the Lord. But that the law would be in jeopardy, being watered down throughout the presentation of the gospel to somebody. He knew this. But that in him and through him it was fulfilled and honored as his followers honored him with their living. So rules and regulations, they're there. Jesus didn't come to throw out rules and regulations. Uh, there is an aspect of regard and respect. We can't just regard the Bible as, oh, we, we believe it is the authoritative word of God and not respect it with our life. So there's rules and regulations, there's regard and respect, and there's also this element of reverence and righteousness. And that really falls into a timing element, but it also falls into, I believe, an expectation of God on our lives.